So this is a little bit different from everything else we've been hearing. Um, it has to do with placing the two epics, but especially the Ramayana in this case, uh, with an well, when a historical, let's say, mythical historical framework. In other words, trying to uh, make them fit into a narrative that is associated with history. And um, also a little bit of text analysis. <clears throat> so, in the centuries surrounding the beginning of the Common Era, epic, Uranic, and Dharmic uh, Dharma Shastra Hinduism was taking shape, even though the name Hinduism was not there. It was a time during which the Brahmanical tradition felt outside pressure from successive foreign incursions in the Northwest, as well as from emerging native traditions that didn't accept the Vedas as a supreme religious authority. It was most certainly as a reaction to such external pressures that the Brahmanical tradition found it necessary to define itself clearly in terms of its beliefs and practices, as well as in regards to its place in traditional history. Brahmanical Dharma had to be distinguished from other dharmas, especially the Buddhist and Jain ones, and the attempt to do so is embodied in the two Sanskrit epics, two different degrees, in the early Puranas and in the Dharma Shastra literature, particularly in the Manava Dharma Shastra. As far as past events were concerned, the system of yugas, along with those of Mamantaras and Kalpas, emerge as the ideal vehicle for organizing traditional history. And I, I better just say a few words of what the yugas are. Uh, this is a system of ages of the world. It's a little bit like the Greek system of four ages, but here uh, the difference is that here they were used later to place everything in history within them, or if not within larger cycles, as the Manvantaras and the Kalpas. <clears throat> the yugas were especially well suited for the purpose because they presented an orderly sequence of mythic historical periods that defined people's adherence to a rejection, rejection of proper dharma. And that is the main characteristics of the yugas. Um, in the first yuga, the Krita yuga, everybody follows dharma. And as we go down, Trita, Dwapar, and Kali, the last one is the worst one. And it's the one in which we live and have lived for uh, thousands of years. Well, 2,000, let's say. In fact, the yuga theory was probably developed precisely in order to provide a Brahmanical explanation for the social, political, and religious conditions at the time. The post-Vedic Hindu tradition could now assign its stories and histories to different yugas in accordance with their perceived connection to the ideals of Brahmanical Dharma. A special import uh, of special importance for the historical organization of events was the present, that is the present of the redactors of the early Puranas and of the epics, <coughs> that is the times they lived in. The yoga theory served to explain the crises they were confronting, that is, all the terrible things that were happening. They had to be living in the Kali Yuga, the worst yoga of all, because that is what the historical circumstances seem to indicate. Through this optic, the fratricidal war of the Mahabharata had to be connected to the dreadful Kali Yuga, uh, a time in which the low status of dharma could allow for such an unseemly confrontation between relatives and for the breaches of dharma that occurred during the war. Uh, thus, the Mahabharata became the marker for the beginning of the Kali Yuga, and all other mythical and historical events of the past had to be placed either in previous yugas or within Kali. But if it was within Kali, it had to be after the war of the Mahabharata. And that is because uh, it became common to consider that the Kali Yuga began, uh, well, the, the Vaishnava saying is that on the day Krishna died, that was the first day of the Kali Yuga. That is not said in the Mahabharata, by the way. The long-lasting Kali Yuga had by then become a current Yuga, the one we live in. <clears throat> uh, the process of arranging past events by situ situating them in previous Yugas is already at work in the Mahabharata and it develops fully in the Puranas. The lists of Vishnu's avatars are especially relevant in this respect because they sequentialize the appearance of the various gods, sage and heroes, that Vaishnavism appropriated as manifestations of Vishnu. Because Krishna, uh, one of Vaishnavism's, Vaishnavism's most important avatars, plays a central role in the Mahabharata, he immediately came to be associated with the beginning of the Kali Yuga 
to the extent that in the Vaishnava narrative, as I just said, the date of the start of Kali was considered to be uh, the day of Krishna's uh, death. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, I won't say much about the relationship between the Mahabharata and the Yugas because I have written a lot about it and want to concentrate more on the Ramayana. Uh, but uh, the point is, and my contention is that although it is mentioned, the Yugas are mentioned in the Mahabharata, they really, first of all, are not central, they're not important. This importance that is given to the Mahabharata as marking the beginning of the Kali Yuga is something that was added on later, gradually. Uh, there are only nine times throughout the whole Mahabharata, which is a, an enormous text, in which there is some kind of connection between uh, the uh, Kali Yuga and the story, but of those nine, only one is part of the narrative. In other words, it's not a secondary <coughs> story, it's part of the narrative. And that is only one word in a one half verse. Just in passing, you know, there's a mention, uh, well, as this is the beginning, or as this, this is the Kali Yuga, then so on and so forth. But that's it. It is never used for explaining what happens, and this is the important thing, because that's what became standard later, to say, oh well, because it was a Kali Yuga, this and that happened. But uh, my contention is it is the opposite, because the Kali Yuga, the Mahabharata events were so terrible, it had to be the Kali Yuga. And therefore that was later included in the story. So later texts uh, added more and more, and then of course it became the norm. Just <coughs> All the list of Vishnu's avatars plays Rama, the hero of the Ramayana, before Krishna. And the story of Rama is told in the Mahabharata itself. <coughs> so from a traditional point of view, there can be no question that Rama lived before Krishna. In terms of the Yugas, this means that Rama must have lived in a Yuga that preceded Kali. That is to say, Krita, Treta, or Dwapara. There is also an element connected to Dharma that, from a traditional perspective, would seem to confirm Rama's placement before the Kali Yuga. <coughs> In the story of Rama, Dharma is ostensibly adhered to and respected more than it is in the narrative of the Mahabharata. We know that in the Ramayana there are also a couple of problematic scenes, uh, but nothing by comparison to the uh, Mahabharata. This means that Rama's adventures had to belong in an earlier and better yuga, one that is higher up in the scale of adherence to Dharma. Where then should the, life, uh, the lives of Rama and Sita be placed in the yuga scheme? In Hinduism, it became customary and a matter of course to place Rama in the events of the Ramayana in the Treta Yuga. <coughs> that is the second one, the first one right after Krita. Even if this placement has very tenor support in our earliest version, the Valmiki Ramayana. It is clear from looking at Valmikis as well as later versions of the Ramayana that the placement of the Rama story within the sequence of Yugas was not considered particularly important. Probably because, unlike the Mahabharata, the Ramayana has no relevant connection to the historical present and its perceived negative characteristics, which were considered to have been imposed on society by the degraded Kali Yuga. By this I mean uh, what I said a moment ago, that uh, the Mahabharata marks the beginning of the Kali Yuga. So that's something, because traditional history really begins with the beginning of the Kali Yuga. Um, the dynasties usually start from there, <clears throat> and of course, that's why everything terrible happens within the Kali Yuga, after the Mahabharata, according to the traditional thing. Um, now, about the text. In the critical edition of the Valmiki Ramayana, there are only two instances that can be construed as evidence that the actions of the Ramayana took place in a specific Yuga. Both are in the last book, the Uttarakanda, which is generally considered to be a late addition to the text. Now, um, now in this brand new slim uh, volume <laughs> that we heard about from uh, In the <laughs> copy's introduction, they make some comments about this, and I just want to uh, make them hear. It, they are very careful and cautious about what they say, but it is, it is important to stress again that both Kandas, that is the Bala and the Uttara, the first and the last, show evidence of being themselves composite works with various sections incorporated at different times. And uh, about the Uttarakanda, uh, after discussing some statistics given by Brockington re regarding mainly meter, say clearly these striking statistics uh, uh, strongly suggest that at least the second half of the Uttarakanda was composed by a different hand or hands than the earlier portions of the text. This finding is consistent, etc., with Brockington and so on. 
So, <clears throat> uh, and, and what I'm going to talk about are Kanda's uh, sargas in the second half of the text, precisely those that are at least most likely or more probably from a different hand, and although don't say it specifically, think later. In fact, the different yugas are mentioned by naming only 20 verses in the entire poem, 16 of which, a full 80%, are in the Uttara Kanda. Of the remaining four verses, two are in book one, the Bala Kanda, while there is one in each in books five and six, the Sundara Kanda and the Yukta Kanda, respectively. Of the four yugas, Krita, Trita, Dwapara, and Kali, and by the way, Krita is usually today known as Satya, Satya Yuga. But Krita is the uh, original name because it is, those names are derived from the game of dice. They are the names of throws in the game of dice. The winning throw is Krita and the losing throw is Kali and the other two more or less in between. <clears throat> um, of the four yugas, the one mentioned more often a total of ten times is Krita, the golden age. The most relevant of these mentions is in book one when the sea and Narada narrates an abbreviated version of Rama's story to Valmiki Narada explains that when Rama yuled Ayodhya after rescuing Sita, it was just like the Krita Yuga. Yata Krita Yuga Yata. Not the, but just like. A comparison meant to highlight the dharmic nature of, dharmas, of Rama's rule, the Rama Raja. Note that this comparison implies that Rama could not have lived in the Krita Yuga. Uh, most other mentions are in the format of formerly long ago in the Krita Yuga when narrating or referencing past mythological events such as the time when gods and demons were powerful, when mountains had wings, when Manu ruled, with, uh, when, uh, when the demon Madhu lived, or when fragrances were pure and pleasant. So <clears throat> um, an ideal past time is usually described by saying, making reference to the Krita Yuga. So in many cases, it's not necessarily really a uh, an attempt of a historical place, and it's just saying, you know, in, in the early good times. Treta is mentioned six times, all of them in the Uttara Kanda, while Dwapar and Kali only received two and one mentions respectively. <clears throat> it is important to point out that many of the mentions of distinct yugas, distinct yugas, are concentrated in one signal, single narration of the Uttara Kanda, that is the story of Shambhuka. <clears throat> Uh, if we don't, that, that those uh, sagas 64 and 68, right? Up from 64 to 60, so as I said, the second half of the text. <clears throat> if we don't count the Shambhuka episode, the Kali Yuga is mentioned only one time, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in the entire Ramayana, <clears throat> that's in the Yuga Kanda. Uh, the Dwapara does not appear at all, and the Treta appears only once, while the Golden Age, Krita, still receives nine mentions. The context in which Krita is mentioned indicates that it is used merely as a rhetorical device for evoking a lost ideal past, as I just said, and not as a statement regarding where events should be placed in the succession of the ages. If the instances in books one and seven, the Balakanda and the Uttarakanda, succeeded, accepted as later, we are left with only two mentions of Krita, zero references to Trita and Dwapara, and one single mention of Kali in the whole Ramayana. This evidences the lack of importance the developed yuga system has for Valmiki, or even possibly his lack of awareness of it, and even to later writers, even to later versions. <clears throat> uh, quick mention of the story of Vedavati. Then let's take a look at the only place in which the action of the Ramayana is linked directly to the Treta Yuga. It is in the story of Vedavati, who is said to be, and we heard about her earlier, who is said to be the incarnation of Vaj, a personification of Vedic speech. She is performing intense austerities while waiting to someday be married to Vishnu, as hoped for by her father. However, Ravana, the king of the Rakshasas, appears and tries to seduce her. When she refuses, he grabs her by the hair, thus humiliating her. Uh, Vedavati then frees herself by cutting her own hair, but decides to end her life by entering a fire. Before doing so, she vows to be born again in order to cause Ravana's death. So uh, the text says, that woman called Vedavati lived long ago in the Krita Yuga. She appeared in the Treta for killing that Rakshasa, that is Ravana. It is with this brief, casual statement that the adventures of Rama and Sita are placed in the Treta Yuga by the Valmiki Ramayana. Nowhere else is the, in the poem, with the exception of Shambhuka's story, is the Treta even mentioned. It is noteworthy that the emphasis in the Vedavati story is on Sita instead of Rama, 
it presents uh, Vedavati Sita as the agent of Ravana's destruction, in a sense, because it is due to the fact that she had vowed to revenge in a, uh, vowed revenge in a previous life that Rama would later kill Ravana. The Vedavati story follows a typical strategy of creating former vows and curses for explaining epic events, but it also gives Sita some form of agency in the killing of Ravana, a crucial feat of Rama. Uh, now, this is, uh, I just mentioned here in passing, but it is very common when there is something troubling in a text to explain it by a former curse. Now, in many cases, it's impossible to know if the story included this from the very beginning, but in many others, I think it's very clear that this was an addition made to justify this troubling fact. And we do have, in later times, examples of precisely that, and how some uh, versions of the Ramayana changed things, like when we saw uh, Sita in the fire, and then also when Ravana takes Sita and pulls her by the hair, later versions, don't, well, uh, most of them, as far as I know, they just take the earth around her in order for Ravana not to touch her, because by that time, by that historical time, touching her seems totally out of the question, couldn't have happened. The Brahma Vaivarta Purana, from between the 8th and the 16th century, a long period, <laughs> <laughs> has many sections, retells the Vedavati episode, but it takes the process of organizing past events according to the Yugas still further by adding Draupadi to the sequence. Mm -hmm. It states, and I quote, in the Krita Yuga, Vedavati was the beautiful daughter of Krishna Dwaya, um, Dwaja, and in the Treta, she was Rama's wife Sita, Janaka's daughter. In the Dwapara, the shadow, that is this Sita that uh, was really in the fire, not the real one, was the goddess Draupadi, Drupada's daughter. Because she is present in three yugas, she is called Trihayani, <clears throat> the three-year-old one. In this case, meaning the three-yuga one. So of course, by now, it's Draupadi also and Sita. They are all manifestations of Lakshmi. According to the Purana, Vedavati is a part in Ansha of the goddess Lakshmi, effectively making her, Sita, and Draupadi successive incarnations of Lakshmi in three consecutive yugas, Krita, Treta, and Dwapar. Now for the story of Shambhuka. It is in the episode about the Shudra Shambhuka in the Uttara Kanta of the Valmiki Ramayana that we find our second placement of Brahma in a specific yuga. <coughs> but in this case, the yuga is Dwapara instead of Treta. <coughs> This narration is the only one that mentions all of the four yugas together. The story is a curious account of, and we again also have heard about it, of how Rama kills a Shudra for having committed the transgression of performing asceticism when he was not allowed to do so. According to this unusual narrative, Shudras are only allowed to perform tapas in the Kali Yuga, and because Shambhuka performed tapas in Rama's realm during his reign, and because it was not the Kali Yuga, the Shutra's flagrant breach resulted in the death of the innocent son of a Brahman. This is a, another story, a separate story. It was then up to Rama as king to right the wrong by stopping the Shudra. Because if something happens in the kingdom uh, while he is king, then he is responsible in some way or another. When Rama finds the transgressor engaged in ascetic practices, he's hanging upside down, and confirms his low social status, he instantly and unflinchingly dispatches, dispatches Sambuka to the other world. As a consequence, the dead Brahman's child immediately comes to life again. No problem, apparently, uh, by just killing him like that. He's a shooter, after all. <clears throat> the story is relevant because of the way in which the Brahman Narada explains to Rama the rules governing the practices of austerities. Narada points out that long ago, Ura, in Krita, only Brahmans were allowed to practice tapas, while in Treta, the privilege uh, was extended to Kshatriyas. In Dwapara, the Vaishyas were also included, but not the Shudras, who will only be able to do so in the degenerate Kali Yuga. Uh, the narration refers to the arrival of the Krita, Treta, and Dwapara Yugas in the past tense, but it speaks of Kali in the future tense. This means that Narada's explanation cannot have taken place in Kali. It could only have happened in Krita, Treta, and Dwapara. Now, I know uh, that in uh, the uh, new translation, uh, have decided to follow uh, commentators who give a convoluted explanation to explain this away. Why? Because it, you know these commentators were writing uh, at a time when it was already a known fact that Rama had lived in Treta, 
So what is this about him living in, in Duapa? That cannot be. So we have to find a way to explain it. And that's what they do. The narration refers to arrivals of <laughs> this I already said, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, however, it couldn't have been in either Krita or Treta because they, were pre they both precede Duapara, and all three are spoken of in the past tense, implying that Krita and Treta have already expired and Duapara has begun. The reasonable conclusion is that Duapara is the yuga in which Narada is speaking, and this is confirmed by his statement immediately following his description of the four yugas. He declares that it is a severe breach of dharma for a shudra to practice tapas in the Dwapara Yuga, Dwapare, and that there must surely be a shudra doing so in Rama's realm, because that would explain the unwarranted, unwarranted death of the Brahman's child. It follows from Narada's words that the conversation is taking place in Dwapara, which is because that's when uh, Rama has to be, according to this. The fact that he refers to Dwapara in the past tense does not preclude the action from taking place in the same yuga because he is referring to the situation that arose when Dwapara arrived and which will presumably last throughout the yuga. Further confirmation that the action is not taking place in Trita comes at the end of Shambhuka's story when the sage Agastya relates to Rama how uh, he acquired an ornament he, had just, uh, he has just presented to him. Agastya narrates what happened long ago in the bygone Trita yuga Ura Treta Yuge Gate, which the commentators again work around. If the Treta Yuga has already passed, their conversation cannot be taking place. Anymore. It is true that the text does not directly state that Rama or Sita lived in Dwapara, but the wording of the, of the narration makes this a logical interpretation. Commentators of Almiki's text were clearly troubled by this possibility. To them, the action needed to have been placed in Trita, not only because the story of Vedavati indicated as much, but also because at the time when they themselves were writing the commentaries, centuries after the composition of the Valmiki Ramayana, it was widely accepted that Rama belonged in the Trita Yuga. In order to get around the contradiction posed by Rama's placement in Dwapara in this story, the commentators did what commentators often do. They read the relevant verses in imaginative ways so that they could conform to their own beliefs. In the verse that states that Shudras are not allowed to perform asceticism in Dwapara and that a Shudra must be doing so in Rama's kingdom, some commentators take the straightforward Dwapare in Dwapara to rather mean even in Dwapara. Dwapare Eva. And then interpret the text as saying that if circumstances are so in Dwapara, they must be even more so in Trita, because in their understanding, that was the UN which Rama lived. Although clever, this is ultimately only a way. Uh, of reading their preconceived, preconceived conviction into the text. And uh, not necessarily uh, just a personal conviction, but it's common knowledge at the time. <clears throat> um, likewise, when Agastya talks of the bygone Trita Yuga, commentaries don't read it as a reference of the Trita that has passed, uh, as of the Trita Yuga that has just passed, but instead to the Trita Yuga of some different earlier Mahayuga therefore skirting the contradiction. <clears throat> but there is nothing in the narrative to warrant such a reading. So I have to explain. Mahayuga is the four yugas taken together. Krita, Trita, Dwapa, and Kali. So that's a great yuga, or sometimes a Chatur yuga, for the four yuga period. And one thing that is confusing, often it happens in the Ramayana, but much more in the Mahabharata, when there is discussion of Yugante at the end of, yuga, of the yuga, it, it will refer to that to the four. I have argued this uh, in detail elsewhere. <clears throat> um, and that's another thing. This is something, this is a thing that is used by others, and not only commentators, but texts themselves. In uh, um, the Shiva Purana, there are two versions of the story of Ganapati. And so, <clears throat> how do you get around that? And so the idea, oh yes, but this was in, in one yuga, in this, in this yuga, in the same yuga, and that was also in that yuga, but of a different Mahayuga. <laughs> See, because one Kalpa or Deya Brahma has many of these, uh, thousand of these Mahayugas. And so uh, we are placed in the 26, 26 of these, in the uh, Kali Yuga of the 26. So, you know, I say, oh no, but that was in the 24th or in the 23rd. Everything to avoid it being in the same one, although the text doesn't say. It. But in, what I'm saying is this is uh, not uncommon. It happens in, in other places. <clears throat> a discussion of the yugas in the Ramayana must address, even if briefly, 
the use of the compound yuganta, the end of a yuga. <clears throat> was this I just said? I have shown elsewhere that in the Mahabharata, yuganta is used as a poetic device to evoke the image of a mythological end of the world, a time when natural disasters, especially intense fires, take place. If one wants to see a connection between the use of yuganta and the developed yuga theory, then it must allude to the end of the fourfold or great yuga, the chatur yuga or maha yuga, and not to the end of individual yugas. <clears throat> In the Mahabharata, <clears throat> the term Yuganta is used for making comparisons when terrifying and awesome warriors' weapons or events are described. It is not used for placing events in a particular moment of the Yuga cycle. The situation in the Valmiki Ramayana is the same in this respect. The image of Yuganta, or its synonym Yuga Kshaya, is employed, for instance, for portraying the powerful and dreadful combat skills of Rama, as when he confronts the Rakshasa Kara or the monkey Kilvalin. But it also used to, it's also used to depict Vali himself as he has been struck down by Rama, or to describe Lakshmana, Hanuman, Aksha, Ravana son, Kumbhakarna, Mahaparaswa, or Nikumba. Such comparisons are employed uh, to highlight the devastating power of weapons, whether they belong to Rama, to his brother Shatrugna, or to Ravana, or some other Rakshasa. Both epics use the expression formulaically in this sense, and its use cannot be construed as a reference to a specific yuga. So, a little bit more about Treta or Dwapara. As we have seen, the evidence of placing Rama in the Treta Yuga is practically non-existent. In Valmiki's texts, where the only instance is possibly a late addition, later versions of the Ramayana make the placement explicit, just as they make um, the fact that Rama is Vishnu explicit from the very beginning. But they do so only occasionally, confirming that the matter does not merit much attention. The Adhyatma Ramayana, for instance, places the action in Treta on only three occasions, all of them in books three and four, where no such mentions occur in Valmiki's text. They are presented as predictions made long before Rama was born. In the first of these instances, the, the Raksha Kabanda is told that Rama will free him from a curse when the Treta Yuga arrives. In the second, we hear that Rama will alleviate the burden of the earth in Treta. And in the third, we learn that Rama will kill Ravana in the Treta Yuga. This last prediction was made by a sage to the vulture king Sampati when in the distant past his wings were burned while flying too close to the sun. Mm -hmm. The sage explains to Sampati that he will recover his wings in the future at the time when Rama searches for Sita after Ravana kidnaps her. When the time comes, Sampati will inform the monkey search party led by Hanuman that Sita is being held by Ravana in the island of Lanka and upon doing this, Sampati's wings will grow back. In Valmiki's telling, the sage simply states that somebody needs to wait for the proper time and place for this to happen, without indicating when that will take place. But the Adhyatma version specifies that it will be in the Treta Yuga. All of these predictions in the Adhyatma Ramayana concerning Rama's appearance in Treta are accompanied by a half verse repeated on all three instances, which declares that in the Treta Yuga, the immortal Narayana will be born as the son of Dasharatha, and repeated exactly in the same way. This is evidently no more than a formula inserted at these places in the narrative to, in order to reinforce the notion that Ravana <coughs> lived in Treta. <coughs> the Hindi Ramachit Manas of Tulsidas follows the Adhyatma Ramayana in stating that the time when Sampati recovers his wings is in the Treta Yuga. Tulsi also adds a mention of Treta when describing Rama's righteous rule in the last book of his rendering of Rama's stories. It picks up Balmiki's comparison Rama's rule to the Krita Yuga but adds that his righteous rule took place in Treta. The authors of versions of the Rama story that were composed after Valmiki text apparently felt the need to add clarifying uh, clarification regarding the Yuga of the Raptures. If the Valmiki Ramayana is largely, largely silent regarding the Yuga in which Rama and Sita lived, and if the two mentions found in the text place the events in two different Yugas, one in Treta, the other in Dwapara, the question is, how was Rama's story definitely assigned to Treta? <clears throat> in order to answer this, question we must look outside of the Ramayana. It was probably the mention of Rama's story in the Mahabharata, coupled with the placing <coughs> of Rama before Krishna in the list of Vishnu's avatars, which established that Rama had lived before Krishna. And this is aside from the fact that there, it's more, the story is more dharmic, as I said in the beginning. When Krishna, along with the story of the Mahabharata, was accepted as marking the change from Dwapara to Kali, <coughs> Rama's times had to be assigned to an earlier yuga. That yuga couldn't be Krita, since Rama's adventures in the forest and his subsequent rescue of Sita includes situations not compatible with the time when Dharma was followed by everyone, as it is in the first yuga. <clears throat> so it was natural to place it in either Tratao Dwapara, which are precisely the two options offered in Valmiki Sutra Kanda. 
but which one? There is a lack of clarity, even a confusion in the early sources concerning this. The confusion probably stems from the similarity between the names of Rama Dasharati, the hero of the Ramayana, and Jama, Rama Jamadagnya, the famed warrior and descendant of Brigo, who appeared in both Sanskrit epics. Rama Jamadagnya, the, the Parashurama, uh, is his name later, uh, uh, conceivably precisely was uh, used conceivably precisely in a word to avoid the confusion. In other words, he was probably called Parashurama in order to avoid the confusion. <clears throat> because they appear consecutively in the avatara lists. In the Narayaniya and the Mahabharata, in one of the earliest lists of avatars, Rama Jamadagni is placed firmly in the Treta Yuga, while our Rama Jasharati is located in the Sandhi between the Treta and Dwapara. <clears throat> but in book one of the Mahabharata, it is Rama Jamadagni and not Dasharati who is placed in the Sandhi between Treta and Dwapara. So this not, it's not still a well-defined idea. As Rama Jamadagni uh, always precedes Rama Dasharati in the Avatara list, this would imply that the Rama of the Ramayana lived in Dwapara. <clears throat> Some early Puranas solved the conflict by assigning the two Ramas to Treta Yugas from different Mahayugas, as explained. Jamadagna to the 19th and Dasharati to the 24th. Neither of these two is our current Mahayugas, we live in the 26th, according to standard Puranic reckoning. When deciding between placing Rama in Treta or Dwapara, the contrast between the Mahabharata and the Ramayana probably played an important role. If Rama had lived in Dwapara, this would put him uncomfortably close to the events of the Mahabharata, with its, with its frequent breaches of Dharma in the fratricidal war that transpired as Dwapara was closing. Trita, on the other hand, was noticeably higher up in the scale of Dharma, and this made it a more appropriate yuga for Rama. The connection made between the Rama Avatara and the Trita Yuga in some early Puranas, together with the mention of Trita in the story of Vedavati in the received version of Valmiki's text, even though it is probably a later addition, surely plays a fundamental role in finally establishing the poem's traditional placement in Treta, a placement that was then repeated and, sub and then sub uh, thus reinforced in subsequent literature. Later texts, especially the many retellings of the Rama story, did not bother to distinguish between Treta Yugas belonging in different Mahayugas, and simply consider that the Rama of the Ramayana lived in the Treta Yuga. Similarly, later lists of avatars are not always concerned with specifying the placement in the yugas, although a connection between the Treta and both Jamadagni and Dasharati appears sometimes. The correspondence between yugas and avatara is never fully resolved in the literature, as some avatars are assigned not only to different yugas or mahayugas, but also to different kalpas and manvantas. Both epics probably exist in some form before the theory of the yugas took shape, but they were soon assigned the position in the yuga system. The Mahabharata was placed at the beginning of the Kali Yuga, and this placement became crucial for Hindu traditional history. The Ramayana, on the other hand, was clearly not so important in terms of the Yuga, and the only requirement, it would seem, was that it be placed before Kali. The assumption that the events of the Mahabharata marked the beginning of a present Yuga turned that text into a fundamental historical marker, and traditional dating is often reckoned from the purported date of the beginning of the Kali Yuga. The date, very often the date is given in terms of the uh, Kali Yuga years. In consonance with this, the Mahabharata is considered to be a text of history, Itihasa. By contrast, the Ramayana has no direct connection to current history, as it belongs in an earlier Yuga. It remained as a narration of events in the distant past, where the portrayal of ideal Dharmic characters became more important than the chronology. The Ramayana was therefore often not considered a text of history, Itihasa, so much as a work of poetry, Kavya. The purported author of the Mahabharata, Vyasa, was to be considered by tradition uh, as composer of all the Puranas, while the author of the Ramayana would be lauded as the first poet, the Padikavi. The precise yuga of the setting of the story of Rama was evidently not as important as the yuga of the events of the Mahabharata. Yeah. I just had one, one comment that was interesting, the way in which they try to address this confusion. One of the ways is since you start having episodes where these Rama Dasharati and Rama Damadagni meet, or Hanuman yes. and Pyami, is to assign some of these characters to this category of the Chirajivans, yes. who lived yeah. over from previous yeah. Yugas, because the Chirajivans lived till the end of the Mahayuga. So, yeah. so they try to fudge the issue, right? But you see, that, that Rama would fight against uh, Jamadagni 
in, in the beginning of the, the Ramayana means that Vishnu is fighting against himself if, if they are avatars. You know. And at this point, there's no mention of uh, Ramajamadanya really, being an avatar. They don't really mention this is all, all these things that start happening later. Yeah. You know. Vaishnava isn't appropriating all of these characters. Okay, so why don't we, after Professor Goldman's talk, we can take questions yeah, for we, both uh, Luis and for Professor Goldman. So just write your questions down, hold them, and we'll come back to questions about both. And they burn it. But instead of the smell of burning flesh, according to the Bhagavatam, a divine odor of burning incense rises from this pit. And they understand that Putana has now been transported immediately to heaven of Lord Vishnu. Uh, because she had that intimate a connection that even the other women of Raj could envy because she had actually held the Lord at her breast. So you do get uh, quite a number of such uh, stories in the Purana, certainly. And, and of course, in the later texts, like uh, Manas and so on, the, the goal of all the Rakshas is to get killed by Rama. You know, they got to elbow each other out of the way all the time and get in front of his arrows, because that's a sure <laughs> pass of death, as we heard, heard, uh, uh, heard earlier, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, the violence of you, the arrow with Ram, the Ram Nam on it, you know, going through your body. It, it's a quick ticket to salvation. Say, let me just say a few words. First of all, to my colleague, Goldman, Professor Goldman and Sally, what a wonderful achievement this is for the last 30 years, day and night. Every day at 7 o'clock in the morning to start the 8 o'clock class and stay here until 5 o'clock when I leave, I know, together. Tremendous work. Abhishna Jano Payoga. No wonder you are also attaining Mukti with this. <laughs> but let me say a few things about yoga also. Actually, I would like someone else to say first anything, a question, because this is something something not covered by the present day today lectures. I mean, I we talked about question, one question. You have a question? First yeah, question. For what what is the great significance of whether this treta or dwapar? I mean even though regardless actually or otherwise, whatever turns out to be the case with all these references you gave, how would it matter in some other sense? Well in a sense what I said, the only reason is that it has to be before Kali, right. it has to be before the Mahabharata. Right. So it could be either. But the fact that Dharma is better in the Tratar and in the Dwapara is probably a reason for sending him all the way up there. You cannot send him all the way up to Krita right. because he did these things, you know. Uh, like <clears throat> what he did to Sita and so on. But, you know, the closest you can come is, is Trita. Because in general, you see, in most cases, it is mainly a contrast between the Krita and the Kali. Those are the two poles, those are the two main ones. And the two in between are, you know, well, just stages. But you either say ideally that something is in the Krita or Satya Yuga, or you place it now, including us, today, in the Kali, because, of course, look at how the world is. And you could say this already, you know, since when the theory started. Um, so I interestingly, there seems to have been a notion among some groups around the beginning of the common era that Krita was actually coming soon. And, uh, and you see the possibility of that in, in the uh, narration in the Mahabharata, in the story about, which is the only one that mentions the happens in, what happens in Kali at the end of Kali, which is very strange because it, Yudhishthira is asking about what happens at the end of Kali. When, why should he know what happens at the end? He's in, she should be interested in the beginning of Kali. But uh, anyway, won't go into detail. But and then there are some inscriptions that say, uh, yes, the, the Krita is coming. Uh, not inscriptions, uh, text. And but obviously that didn't happen. So that could be a reason, or one of the reasons why they changed them from human years to divine years. Because we can see that earlier, 
uh, the durations were 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, and 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. So maybe, but, but how do you explain that nothing happened? And this is a very good possibility. That, well, that's because, oh, they must, he, must be, you know, divine years. That's why. Uh, or, you know, you, ch you change from divine years to human years. And then, of course, it's 432,000 years that Kali is going to last. So now there's no problem. Uh, so, yeah, but no, it really doesn't matter that much. It's just because of, I think, okay. the Dharma, the amount of Dharma. Yeah. Okay, the question I have now, not a question, but a comment on the Yugas. Mm -hmm. the, the worst that could happen has already happened. If you read Mahabharata and Ramayana, whatever, all the Puranas, mm -hmm. all the Asuras have been destroyed, all the Avataras have destroyed everything. So. In the Kali, therefore, you would expect to have something even worse. Kali is supposed to be the time, which is the worst time. And therefore, let us identify what, has, what are the worst things that happened in Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga started according to the dates given in the Panchanga, 3,100 years plus something. On that day Krishna died, Kali Yuga began. Now, Puranas, or even Mahabharata Rama and the dating of them may be 300 BC, 300 BC to 300 AD, common era. That is when the Puranas begin. Let us say Vishnu Purana or something, Mahabharata, etc. These are there. They may have completed, reached the 100,000 level, etc. much later. But at least, so let us find out now. What do these Puranas at that time we are saying about what the worst things that have happened in the Kali Yuga, those 2000, because 3100 years BC is the Kali Yuga beginning. So, so in the, during those 3000 years, what are the worst things that could have happened, that had happened, that we are talking about Kali Yuga, Kali Yuga, Kali Yuga all the time? Zero. They have nothing to say about the history of India, Bharata, Varsha, or anything at all about that Kali Yuga at all, other than Varna Sankara, because if you take the Mauryan Empire before the 100 BC, Chandragupta Maurya is considered Varna Sankara, he is the Shudra Raja, king. Shudra is becoming king, that's Varna Sankara. This is the worst thing that could happen. And what is the still worst thing that, could hap that did happen, for which intervention from the divine was necessary? the advent of Buddhism and Jainism, who declared Veda as Tapraman. Tapraman. That was the disaster that has happened in Kali Yuga. The worst thing that could have happened in Kali Yuga is the advent of Buddhism, who declared Veda Pramanyam as not recognized. Veda Pramanyam, number one, Kasyajit Kartruvada, that somebody has made this universe, some god, Snane Dharmecha, that if you dip in the Ganges, you are Dharma there. Jativada Avalepa, that I am Brahmin, I am this and I am that. That Avalepa, that is the vanity of the Jati. Santa Parambho Papahanaya, to destroy the Papa, what do you do then? You fast and do all this and kind of thing. Dvasta Prajanam, I am coming now one minute. Dvasta Prajnanam, within those who have lost their wisdom, Dvasta Prajnanam, destroyed Prajnanam, wisdom. Panchalingani, Jade, these are the five signs of their stupidity. This is what Buddhism says, Buddhist Acharya Dharma Kirti says later on. This rejection itself is the worst thing that could have happened in Kali Yuga. That happened and therefore, what did the Purana do? Bhaudhavatara was sent, said that this Buddha really was their saint in a Mayavi form, Vishnu's, in order to send the Asuras by give, give, telling them, look here, there is no uh, Veda, there is no Sarga, there is no this and that, and Brahmins are not necessarily the... This is the way Purana, distro, Purana described the terrible thing that could happen in Kali Yuga. So, think about it then, what do the Jains, Buddhists have no Mahabharata, Buddhists have no Ramayana even, there may be some one story, Rama Pandita Sujata and something like that. The Jainas, however, took it very seriously and they wrote 
I would like you to think about it now. Now that there is nothing more left to be done on Mahabharata here or <laughs> Ramayana here or Mahabharata, so Jaina Ramayana, Vimala Suri wrote what is called Vimala Suri Ramayana, Pauma Charya Padma Charita. One minute I am saying now. This Padma Charita made an additional, additional sin of Ravana. Sita is daughter of Ravana. Unbeknown to him, born to a heavenly lady and Ravana's wife takes that baby away so that Ravana doesn't know about it and then abandons it somewhere in near the Ganges, Mandodari. And Ravana, when he comes to know that there is no baby, he wants to get that baby somehow. And the karmic relationship will lead him to this connection, he will come to the Swayamvara of Sita to ask him to marry her and then he of course comes to the Aranya and snatches her away, etc. The Jain has added this and so what I am trying to say now to you, please read now Vimala's Aumacharya Rakrat and you will find that is the completion of this whole thing. Thank you very much. I know that.